first installment in our Exploring Social Justice lecture series. This series of programs are co-sponsored by the library, the Center Diversity and Inclusion, and the Case Spiritual Life Center. In these programs, we bring to campus leaders from diverse backgrounds who are advocates for human rights and social justice issues. I am so pleased that today we have Dr. Natalie Hopkinson to discuss the history of go-go music and how the hashtag Don't Mute DC movement evolved into a more extensive conversation about gentrification, culture, and racial justice. Dr. Hopkinson is an award-winning essayist and cultural Cult, critical cultural scholar who specializes in cultural identity, cities and diaspora, post-colonial history, gender, and media. She has been a powerful voice in the Don't Mute, Don't Mute DC movement and has offered her expertise in the social history of black Washington, go-go music, and culture for various distinguished media outlets. She's an assistant professor in the doctoral program at Howard University's Department of Communication, Sculpture, Culture, and Media Studies, and a fellow of the Interactivity Foundation. Dr. Hopkinson's work asks questions about cultural identity, about cities and diaspora, post-colonial history, gender, and media. She's been a columnist at the Huffington Post and a staff writer, editor, and media culture critic at the Washington Post and The Root. She earned an MA and a PhD at the University of Maryland College Park, and her BA in political science from Howard University. Her most recent book, A Mouth is Always Muzzled, was a winner of the 2018 Independent Publishers Association Spirit Award, and was long listed for the 2019 Penn America's Diamond Stein Spielvogel Award for the Art of the Essay. But her 2012 book, Go Go Live, the musical Life and Death of a Chocolate City was nominated for the Hurston Wright Legacy Award in Nonfiction and is the focus of her presentation today. One of my favorite authors, George Pelicanos, who knows this city very well, wrote of her work. Natalie Hoskinson knows the music, the heartbeat, and the people of Washington well. But Go Go Live, the musical Life and Death of a Chocolate City, is much more than a book about DC's indigenous sound. It is a vital, lively, and ultimately inspiring look at the evolution of an American city. Welcome to American University. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Morning. So I'm going to start uh, this presentation with a four-minute video. Um, this was part of a project that I did with the Smithsonian Center for Folk Life and Culture this summer. And uh, we did a series of oral history interviews on Don't Mute DC. And so this is, this is a piece of it. And then the rest of my presentation will also go through um, and sort of share some details um, on the movement so far. Uh, but then I'd love to just get your questions and just sort of talk about whatever you're interested in uh, based on this. So let's start with the video first. I don't know how to, hopefully I can make this bigger. Seven from Florida. <laughs> they, that's that's here every day. That's why I didn't understand. How could you complain about the music? This happens here all day. It's been it's been successful. We've been here 20, 24 years, and it's been good for us. I literally first identified with Bogo when I passed the Metro PCS. <laughs> I was just like, I've heard this beat before. Um, so I just asked my dude, like, yeah, that's Bogo music. Like that's traditional for. Um, for the DC area. The fire department would come, they would come like three or four times a week, they would meet at the music, uh, and they would come by and say it's no complaint. I would, they would call, I would get the police department to come out. We were getting phone calls harassing, and they were telling us to cut the music off. The person who complained, they, they tried to do another avenue, so they went directly to T-Mobile. We they told me if I didn't turn the music down, they were gonna take my contract with T-Mobile. 
with all this going on, I contacted Ron Moten. I called Natalie, I called Tony Lewis, me and him talk, and Tone P was here, and we got together and we did what we did. That original tweet was, it was April 7th, so when I tweeted the hashtag, it was April 8th. Mo called me Monday morning, and he was like, all right, it's out there. Hashtag is WDC. <laughs> and I think we need to put something up, you know? And I was like, what, like, like a petition? I signed a petition. I was like, this is crazy. How could they do this? Why are they trying to shut down the culture of the city? Why are they like wiping that away? John Ledger, who's the president of T-Mobile, mm -hmm. CEO, yeah. CEO, and I guess he decided to uh, reach out to us and tell us that he believes that the culture of DC music needs to still be playing. He's within the sound levels, right? So he is with it fully within the law. These people have just done absolute damage to him, you know, and, and really tr tried to just take out the business. You know, like that's just not acceptable. Like We've all been making impacts and I think just Don't Mute DC just allowed us to come together mm -hmm. so we can start doing it, doing it together collectively. So we'll have a bigger impact in everything that we do. And when you see everybody come together for the right reasons and you win, I just think that's what we need, not just in D.C., but that's what we need in history right now. Because you got to understand, we were watching these tweets, and at first I was just seeing black people, but then I started seeing all these white people. Then I come in the store with Don, and white people coming by and see these, say, I don't even listen to Gogo, but I'm here to support you. I think every store, coffee shop, everybody kind of played music for a couple weeks long. This is not just about music. This is something bigger. This is about taking away a culture, driving people out of a city. When people say, oh my God, what happened? Everything's changed. They gotta realize that it's not just about the coffee shops and the new condos. What happened to the people who lived there before? Where are they? Cities need everyone and cities are for everyone. But you cannot just cancel people and you cannot erase people. Before they do anything, just ask a question. There's a tradition, there's a history, you know, there's a culture, and it's really important. And that's what's so, so great about Don't Mute DC. It showed people that you still have the power, you still can take over the city, right, in a positive way. We don't have to do rides, but we can take over a block and let you know that we're still here. I think Deep Don't Mute DC is bigger than the store. I think it, it helped a lot of different cultural situations. Go-Go represents D.C., represents people born here um, in a way that I think you can't even describe. So when I hear it, I hear me. Even to gentrification, the beat still goes on. The, that same beat is in our heart, it's in our souls, and it's going to continue to go, right? Are we going to beat with it, or are we going to beat against it? I'm cool with no D.C., man, just don't come here and complain about what we do in D.C. Gentrified it lies here in the District of Columbia Cause nowadays it's do or die in the District of Columbia I got a right to know, I got a right to do, I got a right to be here The real D.C. so stand up, if you a native dog to get your hands up I promised the curator Sojin Kim, uh, the curator Sojin Kim who we've been working on this project to, to let every know this is a work in progress so um, she's still doing some edits to this project and we'll be posting it online uh, eventually. So well, let me. So the rest of the presentation, um, I'd like to talk a little, just do a little more of a deep dive into what happened and how this became a flash, this cultural flashpoint. Uh, let's see here. So uh, this image was taken on April 13th. Um, you know, the tweet, the first tweet went out April 7th, so this was like a week later, um, in front of the Metro PCS. So you can see to the right, uh, you have met the Metro PCS store, also known as Central Communication, and to the left you have the Shea Building, uh, where the complaint uh, came out of that almost ended his business. Um, so this photo shoot was curated by Tony Lewis, who's somebody who's uh, been part of Don't Mute DC from the beginning. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more, but um, this is to me one of the iconic images um, that have come out. Unfortunately, I had left by the time they took this part of it, <laughs> but, um, but it's, it's beautiful. Um, so, you know, basically as the video show, the uprising started on April 7th um, with this battle over music and public space in this very iconic street corner. 
Um, in the months since, it has really morphed into this conversation about how gentrification has displaced 20,000 black Washingtonians um, in a very short amount of time. Uh, also about the city's history, culture, and racial justice. Um, and throughout, DC's indigenous go-go music has given voice to these issues, and the movement has already shifted policy in the arts and preservation, healthcare, education, and it's just beginning. So this, um, these oral histories, we did a series of seven oral histories on June 6th, and we actually did them inside uh, Donald Campbell's store. And so the woman pictured here is Julene Broomfield, who we'll hear a little bit more about. Um, and so, and this is the store, uh, Central Communications. So the, the important thing about Don is that, you know, it really became a flashpoint because he's somebody who, in my book, I talk about go-go. So go-go is a music genre. Um, it's something that was created by Chuck Brown in the mid-1970s, analogous to hip-hop. Um, but it's, it's live music, um, blend of funk, Afro-Latin rhythms, and hip-hop. Uh, R&B, it blends a lot of Afro-diasporic -diaspora, mu music forms. Um, and But what I think, it, most of all, this important is that it's a collection of black-owned businesses. And Donald Campbell is sort of exemplifies that. Before he had the Metro PCS or the Central Communications, he was a club owner on U Street um, and had a lot of go-go clubs. And they were pushed out in the 90s. Um, the ABC board started cracking down on not just go-go, clubs, but all clubs. Um, and so he was part of that. And so we actually thought that the music was dying. And so this was one of, at one point he had four stores like this that sold, it sells, started selling pagers, cell phones, but always sold go-go music. And um, in 95, this, this ended up being the last of four in this chain that he had of, of a retail, of stores selling retail go-go music and also selling, um, you know, communications devices. And so when he, when he opened this store in, in 1995, he was really worried about the music, and he thought the music was dying. And so part of him playing the music and blasting it outside the corner was his, his way of sort of keeping it to life. Um, he actually has one of the largest collections of go-go material, live go-go uh, materials in the cities. He's got nearly 30,000 live uh, go-go recordings. And so basically, he's been sharing his collection with everybody for free. Um, and if you walk down that street, it's one of my favorite corners in all of D.C. because you see nothing but joy there. I mean, people stop, they dance, they do, you know, like there's like, it's like a little street party that happens every day. Um, but unfortunately, uh, some of the new residents uh, did not see uh, joy um, and goodness and joy there. They, they saw it as blight. Um, so, the roots of this conflict actually was a few years before when um, J.B. Smith Properties uh, actually opened this uh, condo building. And it was originally it was a flute, it was a site it was a parking lot. It was a site where there was a flea market, uh, a farmers market, a swap meet, and um, so they purchased the property in 2012, and then in 2015 they announced the opening of this um, upscale uh, apartment building, and this was the. <laughs> this was the the uh, the poster announcing it. She has arrived, um, and so a lot of us. Again, I live not too far away. So when I saw this go up, I was like, "Uh oh, what does that mean? She has arrived." You know. So we had a lot of sort of jokes about it. Um, but these kids at the Shaw Community Center, um, who they live right there in the middle, in 2015, they actually put on a play that said a lot of what a lot of us were thinking, which was. Every time I go outside and see that witch staring at me, it feels like she's telling us it's time to leave. The writing is literally on the wall. And so they actually did this play called The Wizard of Shaw, Go-Go Like Home. Um, they had a go-go band in the orchestra. Um, and they had a kid playing. This is Donald Campbell. And this is the woman in the Shea building. Um, and so the woman in the Shea, you know, and so she's in character. She's saying, out with the old, in with the new. What are all those people outside? Don't they have jobs? And what is that awful music coming out of that cell phone store? So this was 2015 when this happened. Um, and you know, again, really sort of predicted a lot of what was going to happen. Um, so you know, as Don explained, he got a lot of complaints. Um, they ended up, so when the, they didn't get the answer they wanted from the city and the, and the, the, the city, the fire department, the police department, 
uh, they noticed that Metro PCS, which he had a contract with, um, he, they noticed that it had been acquired by T-Mobile, and that happened in, uh, I think, October of 2018. And so they went straight to corporate. So they sent, they started a letter writing campaign um, that went to the corporate headquarters to put pressure on him to, um, to turn off the music. And at first he just sort of turned it down, um, but then his customers had an uprising. Like He was getting 30 calls a day from his customers. They were like, where is our music? What is going on here? Um, and so that's when he called Ronald Moten. And Ronald Moten called me. Um, I'd been working with Mo on various issues over the year, but we were really in, uh, intensely working on the effect of gentrification on black-owned businesses. So we saw this was part of a pattern that we saw um, all over the city. And so we were comparing notes on these things at other places where this has sort of popped up. And when um, Donald called Mo, Mo called me. And that's where we were ready to sort of like, you know, really turn up on this. But it was kind of a difficult situation because he wanted to keep his business. And so he had this, um, uh, you know, he had this contract with Timo. This is his livelihood. And so, you know, he just was sort of in a rough situation. Um, but then, you know, this lovely young woman, Julene Broomfield, who was a, she was a senior English major at Howard, uh, she started this hashtag. Um, and so... She decided that, um, you know, she said, use the hashtag don't be DC. Once you tweet about this, we have to start somewhere, you know. And so she was, so she was very um, intentional about it. And, you know, she's actually a Newark native, you know, um, but, you know, she recognized that this was something and said, again, not understanding the politics or the business of what was going on, she did this. It goes, the, this hashtag goes viral. Um, here are some of the tweets that came out around it. Um, you know, and then they sort of, of course, brought in, you know, the work that the Shaw Community Center kids um, had been doing on this issue for, for years. Um, and the hashtag just started spreading. Tone P, who's the musician who, you, who we saw in the video, he has a very large uh, social media following. So he was spreading the hashtag. Jumped, it jumped from Twitter over to Instagram. Um, and then Tony Lewis, who was also uh, mentioned before, um, we actually had the very impromptu meeting, um, like at Don's store, and we, we all just sort of decide, okay, how can we um, amplify this petition that I wrote the petition from Howard, from my office at Howard, and went back, because like Julene was getting ready to graduate, and I was trying to get people to graduate, so kind of did it, and then the rest of them sort of went to work in making sure that it, it, um, it, it spread. I also wrote an essay for Slate um, on the issue. And Mo got into this very viral confrontation with uh, one of the new residents um, that was complaining about the, the uh, music on TV as this is going on, and that also went viral. Um, then on April 9th, um, we had, this is a precursor to Mochella, the very first musical protest happens at the corner of 14th and U Street. And the headliner there was T.O.B. Band and Mental Attraction Band performed as well, and Wale made an appearance. Um, and this was uh, organized by an organization called Long Live Go Go um, and promoted by these black radio stations. So this was a scene. So this is April 9th. April 10th, T-Mobile says, you know, like, okay, well, you could have the music. Um, and so, you know, and that's eight, 80,000 uh, signatures on the petition later. <laughs> um, he decides that, you know, the music can go on. Um, but in the, in the, the, you know, in the wake of this, I mean, I think we had a kind of had a, Mo and I had a conversation about declaring victory. I really did not want to declare victory on this petition because I feel like getting the music back on, this is, we're only part of having the conversation that we really need to have. Um, but in the end, as Mo said, you know, we needed a win. So we went ahead and shut the, I feel like we'd have a lot more signatures <laughs> if we just sort of let it going. Um, but in the wake of this, the go-go music has just been flowing like the rivers, like everywhere. And, you know, where it's for the first time really since I've been writing about go-go, you know, for the last two decades that the frame around go-go music has completely changed. Um, and it's just, it's really beautiful um, to see all of the outpouring and support toward the music. So Tony Lewis, um, he organized a photo shoot that was at the beginning of the slide presentation. Uh, this is another, uh, another um, 
angle on that same photo. I think I was in this one. But you can see Chuck Brown's son is in there. Um, you know, we have city councilmen. The gentleman right here is actually part of Metropolitan Police. You know, like this was really a, just a beautiful outflowing of support. And Black Alley performed up that day as well. Um, then on May 7th, we had what they what was actually Mochella, so long live go go, um, did this another uh, show, uh, musical demonstration. Backyard Band was a headliner at this one. And, you know, people, I showed this to my chair in my department, um, who, and she was just like, when was this taken? And I was like, uh, it was in May. And she said, oh, I thought that was from 1968. You know, <laughs> like it looked like, it looked like, you know, for you, the last time you've seen that sort of thing, there were fires. And there were a lot, it was a lot more smoke than, um, than music. So, um, you know, shortly after that, you know, then Don't Mute DC sort of became this thing where people, you know, tried to engage us and to get involved in a bunch of other issues. And so Walla Belay, who was um, speaking on this video, is the head of the DC Nurses Association. And so she had talked, she had sort of brought to us um, this situation around United Medical Center, which was the only hospital serving Ward 7 and 8. Um, and this is sort of coming after the, the closure of uh, Providence Hospital Ward 5, um, the city council was going to cut its subsidy, you know, completely, uh, which was crazy because they're separated by a river. <laughs> and it's sort of like saying, don't get sick if you live in Ward 7 or Ward 8, um, which already has disproportionate uh, health disparities. And so what we did is that, you know, the first vote that the city council took, they didn't even hear an amendment to try to save the subsidy. Um, they wouldn't even take a vote on it. Um, we held a go-go. We organized a go-go at United Medical Center um, in um, at United in the in the hospital parking lot. And um, TCB band, a TOB band performed, and the city got started getting scared again. <laughs> and they started calling Mo, they started calling me, you know, and trying to like reason with us why we need to cut the subsidy to make way for a new hospital. Whatever, you know, we're like, this is this is like genocidal, um, what you're trying to do. Uh, but this was a really beautiful outpouring um, at the uh, at the United Medical Center. And so we put the petition, we did an update where, you know, we laid out, these are the four areas. We would like um, restore funding to United Medical Center, uh, restore funding to the Banneker High School's renovation. They had 50 million stripped by the council in the previous vote. Uh, reduce, uh, restore vote, restore money to uh, a project called uh, Project Empowerment uh, that helps, does employment services, really important um, uh, program in the city. And we asked for Ward 7 and 8 schools to have their cuts to them restored. Uh, but really, when you're looking at this in the city council, I mean, what was just sort of disgusting about the whole situation that we find ourselves in the city right now is that when you have $3 billion in your rainy day fund and you have $500 million more in the budget that year than you had the previous year, that this would be the time that you have this sort of surgically targeted cuts to programs affecting people, black people in the city, DC natives in the city. Um, and so it was just really appalling. And what was really appalling was that there was no, nobody was really standing up for UMC or United Medical Center. And even the Post was like, this is unbelievable that this is happening. But nobody was listening. Um, when we got, when they got to the vote, we were able to actually, we got everything that we asked for. Uh, maybe not the total amount like we wanted it to be, the subsidy should have been 24 million as opposed to 22 million. Um, ward seven and eight schools should have, are still underfunded, um, but they actually did listen. And so and that's sort of when we were like, oh, oh. And then the other thing that happens is um, Councilman Kenny McDuffie introduces legislation to make Go-Go the official music of the District of Columbia. Um, and you know, and he's citing Don't Mute DC specifically, and actually they're going to have a, a hearing on that on October 30th. Um, so you know, like it's it's really I think incredible um, that all of this is happening, and GoGo -Go is the soundtrack to all of this happening, and the inspiration for all of this happening. Um, at the BET Awards, the Don't Mute DC hashtag appeared again on June 23rd, um, and they did a whole segment, you know, raising this on a national platform, issues that DC placed on a national platform. 
Um, and there's many more things to come. One more other thing that just, just happened was um, we did Don't Mute DC meets Don't Mute NOLA. Um, so people in New Orleans, there was a musician on Frenchman Street that was arrested um, <laughs> by the police while performing on Frenchman Street, which is, if you've been to New, anybody been to New Orleans? It's been to, like, insane. <laughs> So they actually took the, the hashtag, and so Don't Mute NOLA became a trending topic. And so we organized a series of an events uh, last month to sort of highlight the connections between these two musical cities, these two chocolate cities that are facing gentrification. And so to sort of bring awareness, we brought in a, a, one of the bands that have been involved in that big six brass band, and we put them on a bill with uh, Black Alley and proper utensils. So you know we had them all together. And then to sort of keep it fun, uh, we had a chef battle uh, where we had a, uh, a chef from D.C. and a chef from New Orleans facing off. Um, and that all happened at the, uh, <laughs> yeah, that all, so mumbo versus gumbo was the thing. So these are the two, uh, these are the two flyers that we produced for that. Who um, won? Who won? I don't know. I can't, I, is this still on? Yeah. Okay, um, I don't know who won. We didn't actually declare a winner. Everybody won, you know, sort of a, a friendly competition. Um, but it was, um, you know, just a wonderful. We had about 2,500 people that came out for Mumbo versus Gumbo at the Gateway, um, at the Gateway Pavilion in, in Southeast, uh, at the old St. Elizabeth Hospital. The mic's off. The mic's off. Okay, did I turn it off? Or maybe it's the battery. Try that one. Okay. It should be already on. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah, so we had like 2,500 people that came out. We also did a conversation at the National Museum of African American History that, that next Sunday on the 22nd, where I was on a panel with uh, Melissa Weber, who is at Tulane in New Orleans. And then we had uh, Maurice Hobson, a scholar who studies music in Atlanta. And we talked about music and chocolate cities. And the three of us sort of like compared notes um, about the identity about these chocolate cities. And so we had this public conversation in the museum. And then Backyard Band played, you know, in the museum, in, in the, um, you know, at the museum, which was really beautiful. Um, so pretty much, um, you know, looking ahead, some of the things that are on the horizon, um, we're going to do a call to action conference in November, uh, Don't Mute DC, call to action. Um, we're working with um, scholars to develop a anti-displacement platform that we'd like to sort of push in the next um, the next legislation legislative uh, calendar because you know if we're able to play defense you know and get these wins you know we're thinking about well what happens if we're very intentional about getting ahead of the next one and let's see well, what we can do to actually solidify um, some of these things and really um, take advantage of the attention that is that's going on right now to sort of make sure that uh, DC culture will never be muted again um, and also continuing to, to uh, forge these links with other cities that are also facing similar situation so I'm going to stop there, um, and I'd love to have any questions, uh, feedback, comments that you have. Yes. Um, thank you so much. This is really um, very powerful and very beautiful. Um, I didn't want to be the first question, but I didn't see any other hands go. So it. I just wanted to um, ask: Are you all? Um, is Don't You DC going to get involved in um, what is likely going to be a big tragedy with public housing um, being repositioned to to be um, privately developed mm -hmm. and people not having the right of return and stuff like that? And also. Is it possible for Don't Mute DC to start being involved in um, the push to get a proper grocery store mm -hmm. east of the river? East of the river, yeah. I mean, the thing is, there's so like there's so much to do, <laughs> and so part of so okay couple priorities. Um, so the legislation, the, that markup that's happening, or not markup, um, the hearing that's going to happen on October 30th, we are working very <laughs> hard to make sure that that happens in a way that this, that DC, that Gogo -Go is the official music of DC. Like if it's just something where you're just um, 
I don't know, cutting a ribbon or you, you just introducing a resolution, like that's going to make me angry. You know, so we want to make sure that it's something that's really substantive um, and what in, in sort of yeah, that's really substantive and sort of is like it, and that goes across several areas of public policy um, in, in doing that. So work, So that's a priority. The anti-displacement, I mean, that's sort of like the heart of what we're talking about. The 20,000 people who are missing from our city, and that number is growing every day. And so the anti-displacement, like the housing issues that you're talking about, that will likely come up under the, the anti-displacement plan. Um, but then just more broadly, like that's part of what we're doing the conference is about. It's like we, we're just, it's a small group of people. Mo has been organizing every other week. He's been having meetings at, at Check It Enterprises on MLK, in which anybody's welcome to go and participate in those. And so he's had a good group, you know, of a couple, two, three dozen uh, people who dedicated people who've been coming and working on figuring out like what the next priorities are. Um, but then we're also like, we need more people <laughs> to be involved. And so this is kind of what the conference is going to be, like trying to sort of focus, get people's input on where our, pr our priorities should be so that we can kind of, like, because we can't do everything. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, thank Hello. you so much. Uh, my name is Lisa Curtis. I teach law at the American University Washington College of Law right down the street. Uh -huh. And so on that um, note, I know I have a lot of students who would be interested in assisting with this. Please. Um, so, But I'm curious, too, at the same time, you know, because we are talking about gentrification, uh, displacement, you know, a lot of our students are not from D.C., mm -hmm. maybe don't have a, a good understanding or grounding or awareness in the culture of D.C. And mm -hmm. so I'm just curious about your perspective on, on having people who are not maybe, um, you know, native to the community mm -hmm. assisting in this work. So I'm not native to this community either. I was just like your students, and, or some of your students. That I came to Howard. You know, I was somebody who lived, I grew up all over the place. Um, so, you know, there's absolutely a play. I mean, Marion Barry wasn't from DC either. You know, he's from Mississippi. <laughs> Chuck Brown wasn't from DC, he was born in North Carolina. You know, so DC is like a transient place, and that's part of what makes it vibrant. And, and that's also like, we, DC natives can't do this alone. Like they ha people need, we need everybody to be, you know. And so I think one of the things you could do, I mean, there's there's a number of books that, so including in addition to mine, I mean, there's the beat uh, by Ch Kip Lornell and Charles Stevenson Jr. That sort of, you know, is a way to sort of get caught up in a lot of the issues that face DC. But I mean, if you just come in wanting to learn, I mean, we like totally open arms. I mean, all kind, you'd be all kinds of people have been coming to most. Events every, every it's biweekly strategy meetings, all kinds of people from all kinds of walks of life have been coming, and so you know all of the help is welcome, and we definitely need legal help. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hello, thank you so much for your uh, for your presentation and discussion. It's really interesting. Um, I work also at, at AU here. Uh, I have a a couple of comments and then a question, uh, sort of a point of clarification, I guess, which maybe I'll start with that. I didn't understand what T-Mobile had to do with anything. Like, yeah. why were they, like, able to say, like, uh, just even to start with? Yeah. Right? Like, yes. play the music in the store at this level. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that was sort of the point of clarification. Mm -hmm. uh, the question was, I guess I'm so pleased to hear you talk about uh, going from defense to offense, mm -hmm. you know, and what really strikes me in this is sort of the role of the city council and leaders, right, in the community who are doing these things without seeming, you know, sort of quietly or otherwise and without seeming representation. And I, I wondered whether there's also a role for the organization, your organization, to work more on, in effect, lobbying. Yeah. You know, in the same way that, that their corporate, um, the realtors and everybody else um, are, are being in front of, of uh, the DC Council. Yeah, so great questions. The first one I'm on to, I had the same thing, and that's why I was so irritated by the CEO's tweet. 
the music should go on. I'm like, who asked you? <laughs> like, nobody appointed you the sound police, you know, but you, you know, I just, it just irritated me. Um, but uh, so how they got in was that, okay, so Don Campbell, he, when he started his business in 1995 and he had this chain of businesses, he was selling like pagers, cell phones and everything. And he used to sell everybody. You know, and then he sort of moved to the pre prepaid market. And so he used to do Boost Mobile, um, Metro PCS. He, did, he sold a bunch of them. It got to a point where a lot of, a lot of business stuff. But they, it got to a point where he really felt like he had to just get this contract with Metro PCS. And it had to be a, they required it to be a, um, like he couldn't do sell anybody else's product in the store, and so he moved to. The, he's solely a Metro PCS. That's why I always call him Central Communications because that's really what his name is. Um, but with them, when actually with even with Metro PCS, they made him. He used to sell GoGo -Go right with the music with the cell phones, uh, but they actually told him he couldn't do that. So that's when he put a partition in his store. So the back is where he would sell go go and he had these go-go CDs up there. So basically it was like a museum that he had back there because actually that's one of the things that's come out since WDC people coming in to support. They're like, young people are like, what's a CD? And what do I do with it? <laughs> so he's actually in the process of, of uh, creating a streaming platform actually to like he's just gonna leapfrog um, into there from the CDs to that. Um, but so once T Mobile acquired Metro PCS, they were they took over the contract that he had with them. And so with the people at the Shea, they started this letter writing campaign. They were getting, I think they were, I want to say it was like 30 emails a day, you know, where they, they were going right to the top. So the vice president of T-Mobile came to the store. That's when he talked to Mo, because the vice president came to the store and was like, we need you to turn this music, <laughs> turn this music off, because they didn't want to hear from the Shea people anymore. Um, so yeah, so that's how that he ends up being, you know, the sound police of DC and deciding that whether the music will go on. But also irritates me, I think, just to be, you know, I guess fair to him. GoGo -Go is not about like some big Fortune 500 company. I mean, these are small mom and pop businesses. These are local artists. And that's the thing that, that characterizes GoGo -Go compared to other music forms or even hip hop. Like it is not corporate in any way. And so it really sort of shows how weak it has become to where you can have this person from wherever he came from, you know, <laughs> to be able to be in the position to be able to say whether your music could go on or not. So that's sort of like the, the blessing actually that came out of this is that at a time when, you know, he's already intervening because he thinks, Don is already intervening because he thinks the music is dying. And, you know, he's, he's struggling to continue to support the music that, you know, all this outpouring that's coming has really given GoGo -Go a lifeline, um, which is really powerful. Um, the other question was about... Yeah, sort of getting ahead. I mean, I don't use the word lock. I think that's there's a whole that's a whole legal category to be to be a lobbyist. But um, but I mean, I think like Sabia Prince is here. She was with the um, she used to be with Empower DC and One DC. I mean, you have a lot of groups that have been doing this work uh, for a long time. And I think where Don't Mute DC the role is amplify. Um, to sort of just amplify and turn up on these issues. So DC Fiscal Policy Institute is one of the people who we've been talking to. I mean, they do work around displacement. They're developing a plan. You know, we're talking to them and, you know, just making sure that we're partners. And so that's why it's good to, the, I'm like, I'm at a university. And so, we, you know, we, I'm in a PhD program. And so, you know, we're partnering with these groups um, and to, to sort of be able to understand what the issues are. And then we could sort of like, you know, have a plan on how to turn up on it when we need to. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ed Fisher, uh, native Washingtonian from east of the river. I, got, I actually was in one of those pictures. Oh, nice. <laughs> Tony Lewis and Ron Moses, good friends. Nice. Um, I was hoping that you can give Should a little bit more me. context to the people that are in the room uh -huh. to say how we got here. Yeah. You know, I, I grew up here in the 80s and the 90s. And so, for those who are not aware, like how did we get to this place where 
gentrification is so prominent. Yeah. Why why did the music start to die? You know, mm -hmm. we talk about what happened with Prince George's County, yep. the school system in the eighties and the nineties. Yep. So just wanted you to provide a little bit more context to the folks who might not be aware of the history. Like, yeah. This right here is that was Black Broadway. Mm -hmm. in yep. The 40s and the 50s. Yep. Uh, sure so was. To give some context. To well, and one of my favorite things uh, from Langston Hughes' uh, autobiography, uh, he talked about when his, he was in Washington, he was really didn't like the whole upper, you know, like DC's always had the strong middle class, you know, educated people. He did not like that crowd. He found them very pretentious. He loved hanging out on 7th Street with all the blues clubs. So he talked about the songs of 7th Street. So this place where, you know, where 7th Street, I mean, this Howard Theater is just directly, you know, behind it. Um, you know, it has this amazing history that really comes out of segregation. So I'll say, before I talk for two hours, it, all of that is in my book, you know, where I do give you the whole, so what I tried to do through the Go Go Live was to tell how DC became the chocolate city, how it, you know, lived as the chocolate city, and how the chocolate city went into decline, um, and then using go-go -Go music as a lens. So go-go is the frame to be able to understand all of that. Um, but really, this is all like Civil War history. You know, like Shaw, <laughs> Howard, these are Civil War figures. Um, and I feel like that's what we're, we're, we're relitigating a lot of this stuff, not just in DC, but just all over this country, um, you know, sort of getting to these issues that were never really addressed. So, but specifically about GoGo, -Go, I can say this because I'm thinking about it right now. Um, there were certain policy, so GoGo -Go came into prominence at a time when DC was in the midst of a drug epidemic. Um, drug addiction. Uh, also, guns were rampant in D.C. So those are sort of like a one-two punch that's really devastating the city. And policymakers really did not know how to respond to that. And they found a nice scapegoat <laughs> in GoGo. -Go. Um, so what you found in the 80s, and these were black, this is Marion Bear, everybody was signing off on this. They had cur uh, curfew laws that surgically targeted GoGo. -Go explicitly excluded, uh, you could be a teenager and go to the Kennedy Center or the movie theater or any of that uh, after the curfew time, but you could not be at a go-go, you know. Um, you had, um, then later on in the 90s, what was a big pu public policy was after there was a police officer that was killed in front of the Ibex, uh, which is a go-go club, and that led to a draconian response from the police department and also the ABC board. So they started cracking down on all clubs all bars and restaurants. And the minute anything went wrong, they would start fining you. So again, that's where Don Campbell comes into this. He had to let go of his club because he couldn't afford the fines. He couldn't afford the legal, like he would get tens of thousands, like if somebody got, gets drunk and acts a fool when they leave, the, the ABC board held the club owners responsible, you know? Not the, not the gun manufacturers, not even the liquor industry, but these little mom and pop club owners. Um, and so, you know, so that's part of the sort of context. Also, after DC went into, was in a real financial crisis at the same time that Marion Barry was reelected and came back into power in 1995, the control board came in and just um, eliminated music in schools and sort of set the stage for this sort of transitional period that the city's having where, you know, Anthony Williams becomes mayor and basically the private sector realized that, okay, it's just been go ever since then, you know, since uh, Anthony Williams was elected. So billions of investments have come in the city and it's just been become a runaway train um, that's been running over, uh, steamrolling most of D black indigenous DC and its, um, and its culture. Yes, thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, first, you did an excellent job, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, I have three questions, but mm -hmm. I'll boil it down to just the two. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so when is the next Mochella? Because I'm definitely <laughs> interested in doing it. Um, and where can we find your book? Okay. So Mochella is actually a separate thing. So that's one of the great things that's happened. Like, I think, was it Empower DC that did the Berry Farms? Uh, 
it was it Power DC? The, the, or the, the Berry Farms were the around the legislation because they're they're oh, yeah. okay. So, for instance, Empower DC did an event on, um, in in uh, I was out of town at the time on MLK where they had Junkyard Band play to sort of like raise awareness around the issue around Berry Farms, which is a it was a. This was land given to black people after the Civil War to farm. Eventually became a um, public housing development. Now it's being, well, it's been demolished, and now they, the city's trying to erase it. And so they're bringing, you know, so that's just an example of other groups that have come in and are doing some. So Machala is a different, actually totally different organization to Don't Mute DC. Um, so I'm not sure what they're, so they just did the Million Mo March um, on the S September 19th. I'm not sure when the next, uh, what the next activity is for them. But for us, I could say the next, so we try to mix like, you know, policy and then having fun. So, you know, we do Bumbo versus Gumbo, you know, but then we're going to do like the United Medical Center. So we're going to do the next next thing is actually going to be a Halloween thing. So we've got a partnership with the Eaton um, Hotel, and I probably shouldn't even talk about it yet because I have a meeting after I leave here to sort of solidify everything. But we're going to do like a Hall something Halloween at, um, at the Eaton, very likely, will be one of the fun things. And then the, the conference will be in November, so the call to action conference, which is going to be like, OK, what are we going to do to get in line and what is what the agenda is going to be? Um, that's, and I should know the dates off, but that's November. Um, and then there's the GoGo Awards, which is going to take place at Baloo High School, uh, which is beautiful, beautiful facility um, in Southeast, 750 seat theater. Uh, so the GoGo Awards will be, those are like two of the next big, big things. What was the other question? The book. No, oh, the book. Um, Busboys and Poets has been supported by books since it came out. Like, they've always had it. So I always send people there. But also, like, Mahogany Books, um, uh, you can get it on Amazon. May I have just yeah. one second? Sure. So um, maybe this is the commercial announcement on behalf of the library. We have been putting together some book clubs this year, mostly directed at sophomores who were in living learning communities last year and wanted to kind of still have a, a purpose and a reason to get together and to continue to talk about what they studied as their, in their freshman year. But as I've been listening to all of this and the books that you've already written, and, and sorry, thank you, and there are probably more books like that, if any of you in this room want to be part of a book club, the library will buy the books. I will look for somebody in this room, and I'm really looking at Ed, um, who might want to help lead the book club. Um, and as he just explained, a Washington, D.C. native and really looks at, works on the relationship between the university and D.C. so that we always have a cordial relationship. Uh, I'd be happy to, to do this. So talk amongst yourselves. Think about it. At the end of this, if you want to do a book club really focused on these kinds of issues, the issues of gentrification, of music, of D.C., etc., the library will support you. And I, this lady was <laughs> Oh, actually, we had oh, another question back here. Yeah. Hi, Natalie. Hi. Um, my name is Nobuya. I'm a music and performing arts librarian. You may remember uh, we sit there for five years. Was that at Big Bear Cafe? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, she helped me out uh, regarding archiving uh, Go Girl. Yeah. Uh, we talked yeah. about Go and everything. Yeah. Yes. So uh, the question I have is, you know, the regional music, it's so important to preserve, uh, and, uh, you know, I'm from New Orleans, too, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my friend in, in El Paso, they have a music program in a uh, public school. Mm -hmm. They teach mariachi. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the New Orleans, they have a, not a jazz, yep. but in a brass band. Mm -hmm. And how about, is there any support the public school is getting or they, they're teaching girl girl or is it supported? That's yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so Teaching for Change is a nonprofit uh, organization. That, it's a fantastic nonprofit organization in D.C. And in 2013, they started this initiative called Teach the Beat. And so they used the first text that I mentioned, the beat, um, by Ch Kip Lornell and Charles Stevenson, Jr. And they also used my book, because my book just came out just the year before. So they got a grant. They created a curriculum. They bring 
I go into schools sometimes, they bring musicians into schools, and we sort of do that, but it's been done on a very small scale, right? Because just whenever they can get a little grant or a little something to be able to do it. So in the wake of Dome UDC, like the DC, we've been talking to DCPS about how to institutionalize that, how to bring it in, and there's actually a lot of interest in it. And so it's, it makes me really happy. I'm really excited. And then we're also working. I have another meeting today where we, we have another, um, another initiative that I'm going to be really excited about to try to re kickstart and re-energize the whole thing. And what my big hope for that is not that GoGo is the way that it always has been because it will evolve. I mean, you have a generation of musician, a generation of young people that they're not into it the same way that previous generations have been. And I, this is not about forcing them, but we want to teach them to tr the tradition. Um, but also, what's exciting about some of these new initiatives is that they're going to do either whatever the next genre go go is going to sound like. Uh, maybe they create another genre. Um, because without DCPS supporting marching bands and the Department of Public Rec Parks and Recreation supporting shows around the city, GoGo -Go wouldn't be here at all. So, you know, having that, and so this is, these are the kinds of things that I want to see come out of this GoGo -Go legislation, like institutionalizing that and making sure that it's not just like people are like begging for money for it. You know, so one of the things that I've been really clear on is I keep going back to this. Five hundred million dollars more in revenue, in in, in uh, income that the city has more than the previous year. I don't want a single cent from the private. The public sector needs to pay for all of this, and I want it. Like I'm being really strong about that. Like I don't like DC uh, shouldn't be shirking its responsibility. And there are models. Uh, New Orleans is one. Nashville is another one uh, where they have public policy that supports their musical culture, and they get the revenue that comes with that. And so I think DC, you know, like we're in a position where we can we can see that happen here. Right here. Oh, the mic. Oh, is there one? Oh, yeah, up here. And I think Sabia had one too. The lady in green. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much um, for that presentation. I guess I wanted to wonder if you could talk about this tension that has existed for quite a while with uh, Native Washingtonians trying to be visible mm -hmm. with the presence of the federal government. You know, we've struggled particularly as scholars. When I first started writing about DC, it was hard to find, you know, looking at uh, bibliographies and mm -hmm. sources, you mm -hmm. know, to particularly for kind of rich data and ethnographic mm -hmm. data. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk actually? About and this is another text. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I wonder if you could Gen talk about, can tell us a text of your book. Um, my second book is African Americans and Gentrification in Washington D.C. It's an ethnography, uh, and uh, I was a professor here at AU in the anthropology department. And so I guess I'm just wondering if you can speak about that tension, that struggle mm -hmm. for visibility, which is a very odd thing if you consider that the presence is here, we know it, you see the bus driver, <coughs> you see the teachers, you see people here, but yet that presence is somehow in other realms obliterated mm -hmm. by the presence of the federal government. Yeah. And I'm wondering to what extent you see this struggle as mm -hmm. kind of representative of that um, attempt to not only mute the music, but mute the presence of the people. Yeah, so this question is exactly why I just, why I've been so obsessed with GoGo -Go for so long, because it's such a microcosm or metaphor for all of those things. I mean, everything that you just said is true for black people in general in this country. You know, we're like hyper visible in cities, but then we're invisible when it comes to power and, and you know, and, and uh, you know, having public policies that sort of serve our needs. And so this is kind of like the struggle, like to be unmuted, you know. And, and so Julian, who created hat, she's a poet. And I'm like, she got, she got the perfect word, you know, to explain the sort of muting. It's not that we're not here, and it's not that you don't see us or maybe hear us, but you just don't, we're just muted, you know. So that's the whole, um, you know, that's this whole struggle. And it's definitely in the academy, too. Um, you know, the thing that I'm looking out for, as I think I've mentioned this to you before, is the gentrification of gentrification research. <laughs> it's sort of like when the, the she has arrived thing came up, so I was working with this trans woman. Um, so that's a whole other thing to sort of unpack around she has arrived. The she, it's S is, you know, she, he. 
So it's sort of like playing with the imagery of, you know, the Nelly sports bar is there. And D.C. has a, uh, U Street has a rainbow history too, right? Um, and so they're sort of emphasizing that was what this ad, which won awards, by the way. She has arrived, that whole ridiculous poster won, won advertising awards. Um, but uh, where was I going with that? Um, oh. So I was working with this, uh, there's a trans woman who was on one of our teams because we're doing these forums that how we got a grant from the Humanities Council to do this project called Communicating Across Cultures where we're engaging um, long time and uh, new residents. And uh, so a trans woman was part of our team of facilitators. And I showed her this she has arrived thing. And she was like, oh yeah, I remember when that came. And she was like, they mean the white girl has arrived because we've been here, <laughs> you know? So that's the whole thing. Some of us had been here. You know, some of us have been writing about these issues, publishing about these issues. You know, the other thing that, uh, you know, like I just don't want to see it get gentrified as well, you know. So, um, so yeah, so that's the whole, you know, that's just the ongoing struggle. Hello, thank you so much for being here today. Is it possible to send an email at, um, out to the attendees of all the suggested readings that you mentioned earlier, um, and just so we can have a better understanding of ways to, again, familiarize ourselves with the culture and the, and the issues happening? Absolutely. So I'll say also the DC Library had a uh, Don't Mute DC book club this summer. So they had um, Cato Hammond. He has a book called, uh, I think, I can't remember. Autobiography. 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 Yes. Oh, Matt, hey. <laughs> uh, so Cato Hammond's book, uh, Autobiography, Cato Hammond was a seminal figure in Go-Go. You know, had one, he had, just talk about the innovation of Go-Go. He, he had a web presence for his Go-Go magazine before the Washington Post had a web presence. You know, so it's like he's always been ahead. He's, you know, continues to run this platform called Timot Go-Go, and then he published this autobiography um, that was part of the book club. So that text... Kip Lornells, Charles Stevenson, and my book are, I, I mean, they're kind of, I'm not going to say they're the only ones, um, but I feel like they're maybe the only ones <laughs> on GoGo specifically. But then there's a lot of other texts on DC, like Chocolate City uh, by Ash and Mushgrove. Fantastic, uh, fantastic book. Um, it's, you know, 800 pages, but, <laughs> but all of it really fascinating. So yeah, so I can send you those, but really it's only like three texts on GoGo, and then again, I, I, and uh, so and then the Chocolate City book, and then this gentrification among Washington, and so that's really five texts. Capital Dilemma. Capital Dilemma is another one edited uh, and, and by Derek Hira. Oh, and Derek Hira has a book on. Uh, Yes, he, Derek Hira had a book, uh, Cappuccino City. Yes. Um, and so that was out of his work with working with One DC. Um, and so that also sort of addresses these issues as well. And we have a question up here. Hello, thank you again um, for the presentation. And my name is Lanessa Clarkson. I'm new to the AU community and I'm new to DC. Um, and my question, I came from Camp Charleston, South Carolina, which is also a very gentrified city. Mm -hmm. And my question is, what type of pressure does Don't We BC put on like local officials or different congressmen to kind of hold them accountable with what, with what is occurring in DC? Mm -hmm. And I'm also like very interested in getting involved with like Empower DC and Don't We mm -hmm. BC and like kind of helping out with like next steps too. So. Yeah. So. Um Anybody who wants to sign up or to get information, you can email don'tmutedc at gmail.com. So that's one way uh, to get involved. Um, we've been using the, the change.org platform a lot uh, because it's already, you know, we had 80,000 people. So we do, uh, we've been using that as a way to keep people, get people updates on how they can get involved. Um, one thing that my mom says uh, is, what took you so long? You know, and it's like, but it's, it, Mo, we've all been saying the same, this is nothing new. Like, I literally have been saying the same thing for 20 years. Anybody who knows me, I've been saying the same thing for 20 years. And I think, and so just as far as like holding people accountable, um, it's, it's, and I'm not the only one who's been saying this. A lot of people have been saying this for a long time and, um, and sort of pointing out the problems, like with the go go curfew law in 1988. Like, a lot of people were saying this. Um, they just weren't listening. 
And um, I think they're listening now, though. And so now that they are, uh, you know, we really just have to keep pushing them to hold them accountable. I mean, one thing that my chair in the department at Howard, uh, Dr. Carolyn Byerly, she started doing gentrification research even before I came into the department. I came in in 2016. She started in 2014. And the one thing she always talks about is the, the study that WAMU did a few years ago where they, they sort of showed all of the developer donations to DC City Council so you could see who, who was owned by whom. Um, that's, that is really key, you know, like keeping that sort of information updated and so that we, because a lot of this stuff has been happening, you know, behind closed doors, deals that are being cut behind closed doors, and we just don't even know about it. But what I could say is that from what I'm talking to people, they have never seen anything like this, where people are like packing city council, people are engaged. Sankofa hearing, they got 3,000 emails that people sent out to sort of save Sankofa uh, video and film uh, a cafe uh, bookstore on Georgia Avenue. So there, I mean, people are awake and riled up. And so now is the time to strike, you know, I think. And I, I mean, I don't know how long they'll still, still, you know, like I'll have a mic, but I'll just keep talking <laughs> as long as I do. Um, and I was just trying to figure out, is there a way to, like, um, bridge these cities together? Like you say, we're doing stuff yeah. abroad, but, like, really bridging the gap between, like, Chicago, because, like, a lot of this uh -huh. is, like, happening. And it, it angers me, one, because, like, it's all about, like, zoning laws and the politics of, like, black bodies and black and brown bodies. Mm -hmm. But then also, like, um, how do we keep the traditions alive and keep these areas that have been traditionally black, not even just still black, but just still thriving mm -hmm. culture? Yeah, I, I would let, so this, these are some of the limitations that we have. We were able to go to New Orleans because I, my husband is from New Orleans. I have a lot of friends in New Orleans. When my book came out, I did, I did my book launch in New Orleans because the National Black Association, National Association of Black Journalists Convention was in New Orleans. And so that's when I learned there's actually like a go-go cell in New Orleans. Like people love go-go in New Orleans. And so I had such an outpouring um, when my book came out. And so I've like, I've had these relationships over the years ever since. So I've been doing these like, you know, exchanges all the time. So I know a, a little, a lot more about that. So that's why it was sort of easier for us to do that. But that actually is totally the vision, you know, like if we could get some real, like, and get, by the way, we don't have any money. So <laughs> let, let's just put that out there. I'm just a professor, you know, Mo is an activist, you know, like we don't actually have any money um, to do this, but this is what we've been able to do without any money. So one of the things we're trying to do is like, okay, let's see if we can fundraise so we can make some of that stuff happen. Um, Chicago, Charleston, people have come out, reach out to us from Milwaukee, Boston, um, cities all over the place, even London, like the Dome UDC was in London, you know, and they had, and it was so wild about the Instagram when this happened, this was in April, like right when the hashtag really started with going viral, they had a group in London doing like the beat your feet. They did a video of them doing like the beat your feet dance, which is like a go-go dance I talk about in my book. And I was just like, Oh my God, like this is, you know, like this is really, so this is what the potential is, you know, especially like around hashtag movements is that they can jump, like they jump to New Orleans and, you know, so it's sort of like figuring out, we need all of your minds to sort of figure out how we can make these things happen. But no, I see us doing something, I mean like Don't Mute DC meets Don't Mute NOLA. I mean, I, I want to do stuff with Accra. You know, I want to do stuff with Kingston. You know, like I want to, like we, you know, the black diaspora, like this is our power, this is our strength. And, um, you know, the more that we can find opportunities to find these common, um, you know, show how our, our histories are linked and, you know, how we can sort of figure out how we can get free together, uh, I think the more powerful um, the movement will be. Oh, just one suggestion. Somebody asked about a book. The guy's name is on the screen right behind you. He has a book called Slug. Oh, yes. Lewis Jr. Yes. His autobiography is a great story about growing up in D.C. in the 80s. Yeah, and Tony Lewis, he, they, they lost his video, his, his, so the, 
Smithsonian will have all of these arc, these full interviews that we did at June 6 available in there, um, so you can go and see them, and the, they'll be releasing the transcripts too. Tony Lewis's interview was the most incredible because he ties it. So his his book is called Slug. What is this? It's something. A, growing up in the age of mass incarceration. So he ties it even more directly. Like I see him as the link between, say, looking at go-go music and also the links to mass incarceration. And so, and so his, his voice is just really uh, important and powerful in this. And yes, please add his book to it. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, sorry, I'm losing my voice a little bit. But <clears throat> first of all, thank you so much um, for coming. This uh, is really interesting. And uh, I'm actually taking a class here right now about um, like displaced lives in the DMV area, especially in like Mount Pleasant and mm. Silver Spring. So it's really good to get to hear another perspective. But I had a question. Um, one was like kind of a clarification, and one was like um, more of your opinion about. You've mentioned. Um, like the gentrification of gentrification research. Yep. And um, I was wondering about, like, to me, when I hear that, I kind of think about how, like, this kind of might represent, like, a growing awareness of the issue and, like, the in an interest in trying to help maintain the culture, mm -hmm. which is probably different than what you um, meet, like, intend with that. So I was wondering, like, what exactly you meant by that. And then adding on to that, um, how do you think that, like the two communities should be able to like work together to help maintain the the people that are living there and not displace them and maintain the culture that is there um, in that sense. So the the two communities meaning meaning like the the gentry and the like the native DC population. Okay. So how can they work together? Yeah. So that's part of what we're trying. This, this is this communicating across culture project. So we applied for this grant with Humanities DC um, this was before all this stuff happened. And that was kind of one of the idea. And actually, I very intentionally did not have gentrification in the name of that title, because I don't find it to be a useful way to, to it doesn't open up a lot of conversation. It actually hides a lot um, you know, when you're talking about gentrification. And, um, but communicating, so the full title of the project is Communicating Across Cultures in, in Changing Cities, or something like that, right? So everything I could, oh, so many words to say, vo void saying gentrification. Um, but that's kind of what we're looking at. Like, so we had our first forum at the Reef Center, and we um, we had facilitated discussions. We had about seventy five people uh, participate, you know, in small group discussions, basically focus groups um, to be able to kind of understand, like, okay, well, let's have conversations. If you're across the, you know, like. Without an intervention and without saying, look, we want you all to sort of come together, like, it's not going to happen. Like, we're just sharing the space, you know, and I know that because I, I live in Bloomingdale. Bloomingdale on its face looks very diverse, but we don't go to the same, you know, house parties. We don't talk. We're just like winds passing. You know, we're just, we're just like, we just, like, we just pass each other, trains passing in the night. Um, and so there has to be something that's like very intentional about making that happen because it's not going to happen on its own. Um, on gentrification and gentrification research, um, trying to do better about being more politically savvy <laughs> about answering some of these questions. Um, I will say that, and this isn't just gentrification research. Like this is sort of like all re all quote urban research or you know research that ad addresses issues of of race and identity. You don't have a lot of black scholars at the table that are really being able to shape that. And as a re that's why you get these crazy policies, you know, because we're not like people who have the lived experience to be able to explain what is happening are not there. And that also includes at an institutional level. You know, Howard, this is just like, you know, Howard's like go go, like hip hop, like anything. We do magic with nothing. Like we have no resources to be able to do a lot of like we don't have like all the facilities and all of that. But we have the most important research is which is the people, you know? And so what's really important is that, you know, as money comes so that image of the the first Mochella, you know, where you had all those people there. I know there have been some very high-level conversations at the highest of level, you know, about, like, it's almost like the riots happen, you know? Actually, they're like, well, what, what is going on and what can we do? 
Um, if you if you don't have institutions, you know, like Howard at the table, you know, if you don't have you know community institutions that have been doing the work on the ground, like One DC and, and you know Power DC, all these other organizations that have been around, then that's what I would call sort of the, the gentrification of <laughs> of gentrification research. But again, that applies for pretty much every part of what we know. Period. You know that it's shaped by people who don't necessarily know. And I can give specific examples, but I don't, I'm trying not to like piss people off so much. <laughs> or at least take turns, you know, like just. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, my name is Jules DeRoche. Um, I'm from the area, from the DMV. Um, it's interesting, A, that like a lot of with the analysis of this history is like kind of coming up in the area like some of the the blocks and stuff like that are not as hot anymore so there's like people more able to like move around and like actually engage with the culture so that's like a shift is like a part of that was coming up here is like oh like if you want to do x or achieve y then you can't go in these areas and like the fundamental prejudices and biases are in there it's still something that I'm trying to unpack but like it's still like how that's like t how that's taking shape within when people. you say the blocks are hot you mean like there's not so many bullets flying yeah okay <laughs> yeah. sorry that's okay yeah 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 <laughs> just yeah um, but within the uh within this conversation is really interesting as far as gentrification like is there a way to disrupt that profit motive of like the profit motive of displacement in the way that it's just for people who are not thinking about, hey, like, what are the ethics of this situation in terms of displacing mm -hmm. people and are only thinking about market value mm -hmm. of the of the space? Mm -hmm. Like, is there a way to to add depth to the way that 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 we fundamentally conceive of value? Sorry. That's a great great question and the easy answer is no unless we don't we stop having a capitalist system you know like i mean um capitalism has never been kind to black bodies ever and it's you see that right now i mean andre perry did this um he's at brookings uh he's a good friend one of my new orleans people who i picked up and now he lives in dc but yeah he just did this story on um on he, what he called the black tax, where he sort of analyzed property values. And on average, the, the figure is something like on average, and I'm, you have to go see his, the actual, and it's going to turn into a book that's coming out pretty soon. But the actual value of black people's property, if you control for everything except for race, black property values are like, say, 40,000 less. You know, say, for instance, I can't remember what the exact number was. So basically, it doesn't matter what you do, how many degrees you have, how hard you work, how respectable you are, whether you pull your pants up, your value is, you're taking a neighborhood's property value down, period. Just like a white person will take it up. You know, that's just like the crude math. And it's, it's, it's jarring, you know, to sort of say that, but I'm really happy he did that study just so that we can like be really clear. When you come in, so and people are making that because the thing is, it's a calculation that people are making when they, you know when they're making their pro the less of me that's there or the less of people who look like me, the more their property values will go up, you know. And so the ethics isn't going to come from the industry <laughs> or people who profit from that. The ethics really has to come in from you know public policies, and that's what we have to sort of push for like policies that prevent bank. Like banking is a huge area that needs to be sort of like reined in. Like you cannot do any projects in D.C. right now. I just get example after example. You cannot do any projects in D.C. without gentrifying. Now banks simply will not they will not approve those projects. You know, unless you're they're they're maximizing their profit. So that means you cannot you can't build housing for families 
all you can build is single, you know, one bedroom or, or uh, efficiency apartments, really, that charge a large amount because that is the most amount that that's the way they can maximize their profits now. So, you know, so that's really crying for an intervention from somewhere to sort of say, look, yeah, this might make you more money, but that's not that's not the sort of like the ethical foundation that we should be building our societies based on. <clears throat> Depressing. <laughs> Sorry. We're near the last question. Who wants the last one? Yeah. So just hearing all of this and hearing about the importance of being at the table, it seems like we need people to be signing the, the bills on that table to be actually in the policy making all of these decisions. So I'm just throwing that up. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. So yeah. People in your group or, or whoever are making part of this go-go um, kind of community would want to even be elected officials or kind of put themselves out there. Yeah, I think Mo has run for office. He's actually a registered Republican. And so he, he's run for office in the past. So I think that made him a sort of a difficult, it makes it is a difficult place if you're running in Ward 7, say, for instance. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the thing is, is that, you know, with, so there's been some reform around like the way elections are. So there was like this public financing that, uh, am, I, am I making that up, Sabia? The public financing that was, that was passed, yeah, that was passed in DC. So that's, that's a good step. Because part of it is like whoever's sitting there are dependent on the same donors and getting the same pressure. And so like there has to be like a permanent opposition, you know, or, or just a permanent like watchdogging that happens. And, you know, when you're, and it, again, it just all comes back to money, you know, a lot of times, like who has the resources to be able to do this? Like, I mean, I, even for me, like it's a privilege for me to do this work. You know, because I, you know, like somehow I'm eating and my kids are eating and, but like, it's not because I'm getting paid a lot of money to do it, you know? So I don't really know what the answer is uh, to that, but I just know that there has to be like a constant, um, just constant agitation and, con and it just never can stop. Um, and that's everybody's responsibility in the city, not just the go-go community, but everybody who cares about justice and fairness and equality. Um, it's everyone's job. First, we need to thank our guest.